All right, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, just real quick, hey, uh, thank you. There's a bunch of people downstairs in Overflow, just a little commercial. There's still some room for service. So if, if you can come to first service, you may want to do that. Um, and if you come to second service, you're just selfish. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. No, we, we were talking about, as a board, we're talking about things we can do in the fall, because um, everybody, anyway, but for now, might want to come to first service, eight o'clock, not eight o'clock, what time is first service? Nine o'clock. Revelation 21, oh, excuse me, Revel oh my goodness, Revelation chapter two, here we go. Last week, we were in chapter one, we finished up chapter one last week, and, and the, the, we are, we're looking at this, this revelation uh, and we're talking about John. He's on the island of Patmos, and, and you can see it there with a little circle around it. And he is praying as a pastor for seven literal churches. So these are seven churches that exist in this, this territory, this Roman province that's called Asia Minor. It is a, uh, it's not Asia like we would have on our maps today. That's just like the name of this area of what they called it. And we talked about the distances. This would be like, you know, Pastor Rob Verdine, he's our, uh, one of our pastor, Calvary Chapel pastors. He's kind of a mentor to the rest of us in the state. So he's down in Corvallis. This would be like if Pastor Rob was on Haystack Rock because uh, the governor banished him to an island and, and he's writing a letter and he's praying actually praying for the churches the Calvary Chapel churches in all the various cities including his own in Corvallis but also the others that he oversees and mentor and so we've learned that revelation is an answer to a pastor's prayer over his church because we read this last week he's praying and we find out that it's on Sunday and it said on, on, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And we learned last week when we were outside that that voice of a trumpet was actually the Lord of Jesus in his glorified state, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Perg Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so this, as he's praying and he's, he's saying, Lord, you know, here, here he is banished to a prison island off the coast of Ephesus. And it's Sunday. What would he be doing? He's praying over his churches. Just like when I was gone for a couple of weeks with my daughter's wedding. I wasn't here on Sunday for two weeks. Gordon McCann taught on Sunday morning, my heart was here. I'm praying over this church because this is where my heart is. That's what he's doing. And he hears this voice that is so loud and so powerful. It sounds like a trumpet. And he turns and what he sees are seven lampstands and how these seven lampstands represent. These aren't real candles. Sorry. This one went out. They rep okay, last week we were outside, we had torches. I was going to do torches, but James Johnson said no, so. So he looks and he sees these, these lampstands that represent these seven churches, and he sees Jesus walking in the midst of them. So what he's supposed to do is write down what Jesus says and what he sees, and so it's Jesus writing a letter as an answer to what he was praying for how these churches can thrive, how they can be faithful witnesses of Jesus in a dark culture. The first blank on the notes, the notes are in the bulletin. You can also, I'd highly recommend using our app because it has all the verses and everything on there. Just search in your app store for Calvary Mac and then go to today's bulletin. But the first blank on the notes is, the direct, answer to his, uh, the direct answer to his prayer comes with instructions. Write this down. And so John is writing a letter, but it is not John's thoughts and opinions he is to write. Instead, it will be Jesus authoring a letter to these seven churches using words, an angel guide, and visions of the future. 
John is just the guy with the pen. So as he's praying, Lord, help these churches. They're being persecuted. Protect them. Help them to love you, to shine in a dark society. Jesus says, okay, here's how they can do it. That's the context of the book of Revelation. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the first letter written to John's church, the church that he pastors, the church at Ephesus. What they need to understand in order to thrive as faithful witnesses of Jesus in their dark culture, what's the one thing they need to know? And what we're going to discover, the one thing that Jesus wants the church at Ephesus to know is the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. Time out. This is not about salvation. We are saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast. So this letter is not written to non-Christians. We, we, you know, most people have an idea that, well, if I'm good and there's bad, and at the end there's a scale, if I have more good than bad, then I go to heaven. Nope. Nope. We're saved by grace through faith. It's because Jesus died in our place that we don't have to die. But this is written to people who have already been saved by grace through faith. And for people who have already been saved by grace, we show our faith by our works. And so as the Lord looks at our lives, the only works that God will accept are acts motivated by love. Lord, as we come here this morning and we read these words, you promise a blessing in reading aloud this this letter and to listen and hear it and take it to heart. God, we come here because we want to meet with you, Jesus. And we all have different motivations for why we're here. But I pray in this time, regardless of why we're here, what we would discover as we listen and walk away from this place is your presence. God, would you just build a love in our hearts and in our lives for your presence? And that we would love you with our lives as a result and love other people. And Lord, that doesn't happen through an eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but instead upon God's power. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Chapter two, verse one. To the angel, or the Greek word is angelos, it either means a real angel, like a a heavenly angel, or messenger of the church. And we, we, we talked about this last week. Either interpretation is correct. So it could be to a literal angel of a church, or to the messenger or the pastor of a church. And so to the angel may be interpreted as referring to the pastor of the church, or an angel assigned to spiritually battle on behalf of the church at Ephesus. Both are pretty cool, (laughs) okay? That the Lord would have a pastor in his hand or that there's an angel battling for this church. Either way, this angel represents this church at Ephesus. Consequently, Jesus doesn't dictate the letter merely to the representative, but to all Jesus followers in the church at Ephesus. And so what's going to happen here is we're going to read seven letters over the next few weeks. Today, we're just going to cover one. But they're all going to cover the same basic pattern. If you remember back to like seventh grade English class or language arts class, they taught us about letters and types of letters. There's business format and Well, this is first century letter writing format that John is going to use here. He's going to start each one of these letters with an address to a specific congregation. So it's going to be written to a very real congregation that existed in history. And then we're going to see the signature of Jesus. We sign our letters at the end. In the first century, it was at the beginning. It's going to be the signature of Jesus who's the author of this letter. Now, the signature of Jesus here is going to be pointed right back to last week when John saw Jesus in his glorified form and he's writing this. And we talked about how he was using finite human language to describe eternal realities and human language isn't enough. So sometimes it's like, what is he talking about? It kind of seems strange. But those descriptions of Jesus 
are going to be brought in as the signature of Jesus as the author of the letter. Then there's going to be the evaluation. Imagine if Jesus evaluated this church. I'd be sweating bullets if this church depended upon me. This church depends upon Jesus. So Jesus himself is going to evaluate the church. Then there's going to be a verdict. What Jesus' final verdict is on the church. And then the answer to the verdict. Like where to go from here. Then we're going to come to future warnings. And then finally future promises. So that's going to be our outline for this letter. And for each of the other six letters as we go through them. So we're going to start here with the address to the specific congregation. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. And so it's the church at Ephesus. Now, I tried to get a picture of Ephesus so that you could see it. And I was looking for the best picture that would show us who Ephesus was. This is the picture. New York, New York. Rome was like Washington, D.C. Ephesus was New York City. This is an actual picture of Ephesus. You can see that the large amphitheater back there sat 28,000 people. Huge city. Ephesus, as, as you look at the New Testament and archaeology, I'm kind of an archaeology geek. I love it. As you look at Ephesus, is the most dug up city in the New Testament outside of Jerusalem. We know more about Ephesus than any other cities, but even how much we have dug up, it's only 15% of the actual city. Here's a, a recreation of what Ephesus would look like in the first century. But as you look at this, it's uh, one word you could use to describe Ephesus is money. Exceedingly wealthy. In fact, if you look at Central Park, most of you know that the real estate, the the townhomes or the apartments around Central Park is the most valuable real estate in America. If you look at the ruins of Ephesus, the, the, the terrace houses, they were opulent. Tremendous wealth. Because of that harbor and because of their location, the ships of the world would bring in all the goods and there were sailors and it was this, this wealth, huge city, New York City for the Roman Empire. And so one word to describe Ephesus would be money. A second word to describe Ephesus is debauchery. There's a word we don't use very much. But if you want to see debauchery, this is what debauchery looks like. Probably New York, yeah, it's, it's what Ephesus was, but it was also Las Vegas. And if only there was a way to combine Las Vegas and New York City. Oh, wait, there is. They already did it. Okay. So... The reason it's, it's, it's like New York meets Las, Las Vegas is because it had the temple to Artemis. Now, Artemis is a fertility goddess. She was worshipped around the Roman Empire. But Artemis is, is called, sorry about this, it's church. I know she was the many-breasted god goddess. So all of the breasts there, you can see them. Just to give you a perspective, this statue, this marble statue is nine feet tall. It's a big statue. And, and, and you may not recognize she's a fertility goddess and she was very much loved. Uh, you don't know her as Artemis. You know her by her Latin name, Diana. There is nothing new under the sun. Wonder Woman is based off Artemis. That's why her name is Diana. Now, Artemis had the temple to Artemis, which they found the remains of. There's pieces of it in the British Museum. There, uh, there's not much left, but it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And people would come from all over, tourists from all over the Roman Empire because of fertility goddess, but also the worship of the fertility goddess involved uh, temple prostitutes. And so you put that combination together where you have a port city with sailors from all over and they would come here and they would go and worship this goddess through temple prostitution. 
And then they would get these little Artemis idols. These, they've been found all over the Roman Empire because everybody came here and you find it everywhere all over there. Debauchery, they would have these pagan ceremonies that were highly sexualized. I mean, she was a very popular goddess because of all the sexuality to it. And into that climate walks this guy, the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul comes into this, st- into this city on purpose, strategically, because he came to this city because if you can make it in New York, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Same thing here. Because you come into this city, if you spread the gospel here, it gets taken across the empire. And that's exactly what happened. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 19. In fact, if you ever get the chance to go to Greece or to the Mediterranean and you get the chance to go to Ephesus, I mean, this is a bucket list for me. You go to Ephesus. If you go to Israel, there'll be sites like, well, this could be where the crucifixion was or this could be the the garden tomb. You know, we think it could be this is a no-doubter. There is no doubt that Acts chapter 19 happened right here in this arena, 28,000-seat amphitheater. And if you read about it, what happened is Paul was so successful in spreading the gospel that it caused a riot. (laughs) And they went here for two hours yelling, great is Artemis of Ephesus! Great is Artemis of Ephesus! Two hours yelling! And you can read out chapter 19 to find out what happens, but that happened right here. You could go stand there today. So if you think about this, Jesus is writing a letter through John to the resulting church that Paul started here at Ephesus. Timothy took over from Paul, and then John himself eventually took over as the pastor. That's who this letter is written to. That's the climate that he came into. Say it this way. Outside of the church of Jerusalem, there really wasn't a more prominent congregation in the first 40 years of church history. The book is featured in the books of Acts, or excuse me, Ephesus. The city is featured in the book of Acts, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy were written from their founding pastor to the person who took over for him. The Apostle John wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Gospel of John from there, from Ephesus. So outside of Jerusalem, we really know more about Ephesus than any other city in the New Testament era. And you know what's amazing is is Ephesus is often called a test case for the Bible's authenticity because we know so much about it in the New Testament and we've found so much has been dug up. And is what the Bible say true? And what we find is that the Ephesus in Scripture and the Ephesus in archaeology, one and the same, down to details that you would never even notice, like the silversmiths who, who caused the riot. There's a monument paid for by that group of silver, silversmiths that they dug up and signed by them. Crazy stuff like that. The Bible is not mythology, it's history. And so that was the address to the congregation. Now we move to the signature of Jesus. You know, this is him saying, hey, it's from me, Jesus. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. You can take an arrow in your Bible and go right back to chapter one there. Because when John saw Jesus, he saw the the seven lampstands and he saw the seven stars in his hand goes right back to him. This is from Jesus. And Jesus introduces himself with a statement declaring his authority to author this letter to the church. So then we come to the evaluation. And I'm sure John, as he's writing down what Jesus is saying, is probably sweating. Here we go. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. And so... At this point, John's like, okay, we're okay. (laughs) Because it's hard. It's like Jesus is saying, I know. I know the culture that you're in, the society you're in, how dark it's in. Did you know that Jesus will look at the church at McMinnville? 
at the various churches in McMinnville, he'd look at our church and he says, I know it's hard to live for Jesus in Oregon. I know it. I know it's hard to live for Jesus in the Portland metro area. It's hard. It's like Jesus would look at us and say, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. You know, Jesus applauds them for being a light in a dark culture and that he knows how hard they've worked and endured to minister and serve people in a hostile culture. You know, who knows what it was like? You know, you imagine all these sailors, how many of the sailors blew their money on gambling or on prostitutes, but the church was there to care for them and feed them, sharing the gospel, spreading the news of Jesus across this dark city. And it was, you look at the movement of the church, Ephesus was key at seeing the expansion of the gospel across the Roman Empire. I mean, it was a lot of work being done here. Good work. <clears throat> I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, not about non-Christians there, by the way. That line is specifically speaking about people in the church. People who claim to be Jesus followers. Because it says you cannot tolerate wicked people. Well, they, could, they wouldn't be in Ephesus. We, we tolerate non-believers. Of course, we love them. You know, we go and we, that's what we're supposed to do. That's our job description. But he's talking about people who claim to be followers of Jesus in the church, but refuse to give up lifestyles contrary to God's wishes, to God, what God values. And he's saying, I know you, you, you cannot tolerate people who claim to be Christians, but live like the world. No compromise. They wouldn't pacify people claiming to be Jesus followers, but living lifestyles opposite to God, God's character. Well, today, one of the great weaknesses of the church is the fact that too many churches tolerate evil as if God approves of Christians partaking in evil practices. We're under tremendous pressure to accept and approve of ungodly lifestyles and say, it's okay. But the Ephesians lived different. What's our mission statement? Live different than the rest of society. And so should we. Again, you know, it, there's an epidemic in the church. It, it, the church is, is falling off the cliff of society, giving into things because they don't want to be called hateful giving into things because they don't want to be considered unloving. It's not unloving to speak the truth. It's hateful to speak lies. And it's epidemic in churches. And churches that have stood for decades are bending the knee to cultural pressures. That's not love. That's hate. That's hate. It's not going to happen here, Lord willing. And I know what Lord's will is on that. But anyway, enough of that. Here we go. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not and, ha and have found them false. I mean, you think about it. This church was started by the apostle Paul and then handed off to Timothy. Two books are named after him, written by their founding pastor. And then the apostle John came over and took over leadership of the Ephesians church. That's a rich spiritual heritage. Now, as I read scripture, the office of an apostle is no longer a valid office because an apostle was hand chosen by Jesus, personally picked by Jesus and trained by Jesus, including the apostle Paul. So the office of apostle died when the last apostle alive, John, died, there were no more apostles. But what would happen, and so I'm just saying that because if there's churches today, hello, New Apostolic Reformation, churches like Bethel and Hillsong that claim to have an office of apostle, that's a pretty bold claim considering Jesus had to hand choose, choose you and train you. Dangerous ground, dangerous ground. But people were coming at that church saying, hey, I'm an apostle. And they 
said, okay, well, let's check you out. And they checked them out. You know, Paul warned them that this was going to happen. Remember their founding pastor, Paul? Acts 20, when, they're saying, when he was saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, the overseers, he said, keep watch over yourselves and over the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, <coughs> excuse me, which he brought, bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will try and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. That with tears, do you hear his motivation of love there? The passion for God, the passion for truth. Well, the Ephesian church listened to Paul's warning. They were not a compromising church. They were a discerning church. And boy, do we need discernment today. And discernment does not mean doing a Google search. <laughs> Let me explain the internet to you. It's called algorithms. Do you know why it seems everybody on the internet agrees with you? It's called algorithms. They track you. They know what you like. And so when you search it, you'll find what you want to hear. Okay? That's not discernment. Discernment is found through prayer, the Holy Spirit, and God's word. That's our authority. We need discernment. They were a discerning church. They didn't just trust a person's message, opinion, or leadership because of what they claimed to be, but instead put them to the test in order to protect the flock. You have per persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. You know, it, it, it's hard to live for Jesus in a dark society. They didn't give up. They kept going. They kept shining the light, meeting needs in a dark culture. And at this point, you know, Jesus is speaking. John's writing down what Jesus is speaking. And John's like, yes. A plus. We passed. This is a good church. This is a healthy church. Hard working. This is persevering, discerning endurance. I am so thirsty. <laughs> Spilling water all over me. I, I need something more. I need a Dr. Pepper. All right. All right. All right. Hold on here. <laughs> Gary, Gary, or Alex. Uh, do you want some? Let me see here. Hold on. Okay. I have water dripping from me. Okay, here we go. Ready? It's empty. All right. So it appears, it appears to be a Dr. Pepper on the outside. It looks good on the outside but it's empty on the inside. The only works God will accept are acts motivated by love, which brings us to the verdict. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. And Jesus is he's saying that despite, despite all this, Despite all this ministry in a dark society, enduring hardships, and protecting the church with sound theology, teaching, and doctrine, they are on the verge of closing. Jesus is going to close their doors because there is something seriously wrong. And what's wrong is exactly what their founding pastor Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. First Corinthians 13, if I speak with the tongues of, an, of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It's like somebody, you guys, all this work you're doing, just clanging cymbals. Doesn't do anything except annoy people. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, 
I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship, probably exact description of what the Ephesians were doing. It's feeding the poor, enduring hardships in this society that's starting to persecute Christians. That I may boast, but I do not have love. I gain nothing. So by human evaluation, this is a model church. In fact, if this church existed in America today, they would have a pastor's conference in which thousands of pastors from all over the country would go there to find out how they do ministry and go there and find out, well, this is how we do things. Here's our strategy. Here's our philosophy of ministry. Here's how we do worship bands. This is how we do kids ministry. This is how we do youth ministry. It, man, this is the way to do it. But Revelation, here's our illustration. It's night vision goggles. Because what appears to be something, if, if you looked at this church with night, the night vision goggles presented in Revelation, what you find is it's empty. It's empty. Because the greatest characteristic of living life as a Jesus follower is love. The fruit of the spirit is love. It's what the tree of being a Christian produces is love. It's agape which was this new word in the Greek language no one really used. Paul defined it. What's agape love? It's love. It's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what agape love is. And without that, it's just empty. It looks like a Dr. Pepper can, but there's nothing in it. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 22. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Man, love the Lord. Paul, I I, I spoke to you with tears because of his passion for the Lord, for Jesus. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So you love the Lord. That's the motive for everything you do is you love the Lord and you love people. That is to be our motive because it's the fruit of the spirit. And if you're depending, not willpower, I'm not willpowering my way to love people. I'm saying, God, I can't love people. In fact, they annoy me. Would you give me the power to love them? Would you baptize me in the spirit and produce fruit? And spiritual gifts in my life to love people, that fruit resulting is love and gifts of the Spirit, not talent of the flesh. There is nothing that glorifies God more than love because God is love. Thus, as as a Jesus follower, whatever volunteering, work, VBS volunteering I do, worship band playing, service project, getting involved with safe families, you know, we're having that meeting, we're keeping kids out of the foster care system, bike trip volunteer, mowing your neighbor's lawn because you want to be a good neighbor. Do you want to appear to be a good neighbor or is it because you're loving God and loving them? Visiting your aunt in the old folks' home, any of that. Or any other service I offer God, behind them all must be the motivation of love. Raising your hand in worship, did you know this? Some people, it's like, they raise their hand because they want to look all spiritual. Look at how spiritual. They love to worship. Powerful. Well, if my hand raising... You know, the, the, God's word says to, to raise our hands and worship. You know, there's other people, they're not going to raise their hands because, man, I don't want to look like a show off. That's not love either. It's not obedience either. God's word says, raise your hands and praise to the Lord. So if you're sitting here going, I'm not raising my hands, or you're sitting there, hey, look at me, I'm raising my hands. That's not a motivation of love. God, would you give me a passionate love for you? I love you. Lord, just fill me with your love. And it expresses itself by raising hands in obedience and praising the Lord. And if it's not that, don't. I don't even know where I am anymore. Okay. (laughs) Because here's the thing, and, and most churches don't talk about this. 
But after the rapture of the church, I just lost some of you. You all millennials, it's fine. We'll get, we'll get to this. But I believe scripture teaches there's a rapture of the church. After a rapture, and don't get distracted, after the rapture of the church, before the great white throne judgment, which is at the end of the tribulation, where everyone is judged if they accepted Jesus or not, excuse me, those who, who haven't chosen Jesus are judged. Each Jesus follower, before that happens, they will stand before God at what's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And when we stand before Jesus to be judged, our works will be judged. A side note, this isn't about salvation. We're saved. Praise God that when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, I'm saved. But this is having to do with works of worship, our sacrifice of praise to the Lord. We'll stand before God at what's called the Bema Seat. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 10. Again, this is not about salvation. You're already saved. This is about what you did with your salvation. It's in, here's 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the Bema Seat, the judgment seat of Christ. It's talking to Christians here. So that each of us may receive what is due us. This is called, talking about rewards, not salvation. We may receive what's due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Talked about it earlier in 1 Corinthians. He said this. It's Paul again. <coughs> Excuse me. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone, he's talking about building the church at Corinth. Someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, so that would be like love, passion for the Lord, passion for people, or wood, hay, or straw, you know, those are other motivations. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. That's a freaky verse. Man. As a pastor, man, there's stuff, when you do stuff, oh man, it looks like, man, they, 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 they love Jesus. But it's done, if it's done out of the flesh, yeah, as a pastor, I'll be saved, but everything else is just going to burn because it's all just a work of the flesh. <laughs> Boy, Lord, may that not be. Or how many people do just these huge ministries, they may get saved, but just by the skin of their teeth because Jesus died for them and that's it. Everything else was just a show. Woo. The world evaluates via appearances. The world would define a successful church far differently than Jesus would. The world evaluates via appearances. Jesus evaluates via our motivation. And the only works that God will accept are acts motivated by love. Then we get to the answer. I don't know about you, but I'm reading this and I'm studying this and I'm going, oh, Lord, we need you <laughs> because I know my heart and I know how often my heart is. Man, I just want to give this message and just impress people. Or, you know, I... You know, I feel obligated. I need to go out front. It's nine in the morning, nine o'clock service and go greet people. Hey, how you doing? Don't mock me. You do the same thing. Only you're just not a pastor. So I, anyway. And you sit there and go, oh, dear Lord, I don't even know what to do at this point. I'm like, you know, if I'm John, okay, John, what do we, you know, Jesus, what do we do? Well, he tells you what he, to, what to do. He says right here, here's the answer. Consider how far you have fallen. So remember the context, okay? He, he's on Patmos. He's praying over these churches. And these are the people he loves, his own church at Ephesus, the other churches that he oversees, the pastors of, and he's, he's praying over them. 
He says, remember how far you've fallen. All the things that we've read and talked about with Ephesus. Well, John just found out from the mouth of Jesus that the church he pastors has a fatal flaw. So what can we do? It's not that Jesus is saying, you know, bing. Jesus is saying, no, this is what to do, John. Here's the answer. Number one, remember. Remember the love and passion you had when you first heard about Jesus and this church first started. Fortunately, we know all about it. Acts chapter 19, we get to read about when this church started. So we know what it was like. We know the passion and the love that existed at the beginning of this church. Acts 19 verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. That's where he always started. <clears throat> he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, some of the Jews. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. You know, it's interesting, talk about archaeology. Everybody's like, the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where is that? Well, as they dug up in Ephesus, the family named Tyrannus is everywhere. They were a prominent, rich family in Ephesus, just like the Bible says. There was a lecture hall named after them. This went on for two years. Look at this. So that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So what that means is in Paul's ministry, all these cities, this, is the, this would be like saying all the Jews and Greek in Oregon heard the gospel. All the Jews and Greeks in this Roman province of Asia, they all heard the gospel. So this is the beginning. And look at what happened here, okay? Verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. Because what was happening, he was so successful at spreading the gospel that remember that little business, the, the, the idols that everybody would buy and take home to their own city? They started losing business. They started going out of business. They're going, hey, we got to do something about this. <clears throat> They were all seized with fear and the, uh, and the name, oh, excuse me, that was a different part. I'm, I'm lying right there. This is about the Satanists or the, the sorcerers. They were all seized with fear because all these miracles that were happening in the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, which is multi-millions of dollars today. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. That's what was happening. This is a famous drawing of Paul preaching. And they were, these, these sorcerers are saying, this, this stuff is junk. Throw it away. We're following Jesus. That's how this church started. So Paul and that early church, they served Christ out of, it wasn't out of obligation or because they were supposed to. They were serving Christ because they were blown away by who God is. They loved Jesus and they loved other people. That's where they started. And Jesus is like, think about where you started. Think about where you are now. I think most of us can remember when we first accepted Jesus. The passion, the love, the wonder, and where we are now. Well, I guess I'll go on Sunday because they have donuts. <laughs> the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. Consider how far you've fallen. Okay, that's remember. And then repent. Repent. Okay, the world has no idea what the word repent means. They have no idea about it. They know what regret is all about, like temporary regret or getting caught. They know all that. Repent is different. It's not just regretting getting caught or being called out by Jesus for lack of love. Instead, first you remember, then you repent. 
Repentance isn't worldly regret, but it's genuine sorrow accompanied by a change in attitude and behavior. And the reason for that change in attitude and behavior when it comes to repent, repent is, you know, you're, you're going this way. Repent means you turn and go the opposite way. But you don't go the opposite way because of willpower. If you're going this way, you, you, you regret it. And you're like, I'm just going to try to do better next time. And then you fail. Repent is you're going this way and you say, God, I can't do it. I have failed again. I can't do it. Would you give me the power to walk in your ways? That's repentance. Because the Holy Spirit comes and gives you the power to obey. That's repentance. So start, just remember where you, how you came to Jesus and then repent of how far you've fallen. And then repent and do the things you did at first. And so what's Jesus' answer to how the Ephesian church can keep their flame lit? Don't just go through the motions of church. Don't just teach Jesus, work hard, endure through hard times, discern doctrine, and watch for false teachers. You remember, you repent, and then redo. You go back to the original love, attitude, and behaviors you had when you first followed Jesus. What are the things you did when you first found Jesus? You know, how about turning off your smartphone and grabbing your Bible and reading? Read, do what you did when you first came to Jesus. I look back on the most significant times in my life you know, if I, if I know, man, I've lost that, I'm not, you know, serving out of a motive of love. I'm not, you know, worshiping out of a motive of love. I'm just kind of doing things out of obligations. I, I stop and I remember, this is where I've come from. Lord, I have fallen into just, I'm dry. I, I, I just don't have the strength to love you or love others. Would you give me the strength to love would you give me the power to love? And then he says, redo. Start doing those things you used to do. One of the things I do, Lord, is I would go on long walks listening to worship music, which is so easy right now. Just go to Spotify, find a worship mix, go to Apple Music. And Lord, I'm listening and filling my heart with worship. Lord, I'm just going to put worship on in the background at home while I'm you know, just kind of working around the house. I'm just going to listen to teachers, Lord. I'm going to, there's so many excellent, I'm just going to go back and do what I used to do. And you see, that's Jesus' answer for a dry heart. Remember, repent, and then redo. Pretty simple. Not out of legalism or obligation or duty, but because you're dependent on the Spirit to produce love for God and love for people in your heart. Because the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. And then here's the next part of the letter, future warnings. This is hard stuff. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The consequences of just continuing business as usual means that Jesus will remove their light and his presence. If their lampstand is removed, they could continue as an organization, but no longer as a true church of Jesus Christ. America is full of a bunch of churches where the presence of Jesus is nowhere to be found. has nothing to do with Jesus. Looks religious, looks spiritual. But what has happened is, man, they just continued business as normal without love. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm just going to remove my light. Because even though they look religious, and appearing to be doing the Lord's work, Jesus will have nothing to do with it because it's a work of human flesh, not a work of the Spirit. The only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. 
But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I always hate, which I also hate. Circle that word Nicolaitans. It's going to come back up in the letter to Pergamum. Because this is almost like a, a side note here. It's like a postscript to the letter. Said, hey, but you do have this going for you. you. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, nobody wants to be a hater. Jesus was a hater. He hated practices that had nothing to do with him or the spirit. So we better figure out who the Nicolaitans are. It's actually fairly simple to figure out who they are. It's in the name. Nico means priests. Laetone means it's laity. And so the basic, you know, is, in short, it's establishing a priesthood, mediators between God and man, so that people have to go through a priest to have a relationship with God. Now, as we talk about these churches, each church is going to represent a different age in the church age. When we get to Pergamum and they start talking about the Nicolaitans again, it's representing when the church became the state religion of the Roman Empire, which produced the Roman Catholic Church. And eventually uh, the uh, Orthodox Church, which established a priesthood that you had to go through a priest to get to the Lord. So the moment Jesus died... On the cross, the curtain dividing man and God was torn in two. I always wondered, like, what did they do? Did they, like, sew it back up? Like, or did they get a new curtain? Would they undo what God did? Probably. But by AD 95, the Nicolaitans were already trying to establish a hierarchy of priests as a middleman. Jesus is saying he hates the practice that would force some person between you and the Father that is not necessary unless that is the person of Jesus Christ. He is our priest. Okay? Very important. We'll come back to that in a couple of letters. Now we get to the really interesting part. Verse 7, the future promises. Here we go. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. Underline that, what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, we know what the tree of life is. We know what the tree of life is because we went verse by verse through the book of Genesis, and the tree of life was there. This is not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is the tree of life, pointing to Jesus, by the way. Well, that tree of life is going to come back in Revelation chapter 20. It, we, one day, if you're a Christ follower, you're going to see the tree of life. You're going to taste fruit from this tree. Pretty cool. So we know where the, where this will come back in chapter 20. But, but look at this. Notice who's speaking. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. So John is dictating what Jesus is saying. Now it's saying the Spirit's speaking. So who's speaking? Is it Jesus or is it the Spirit? Yes. It's both. John is writing the words he hears Jesus speaking. But the Holy Spirit is at work too. The Trinity always works in tandem or yeah, tandem would be the word. But the Holy Spirit is at work too, both in the writing of the letter and, here's the key, right now he's at work. In those who study the letters to the seven churches today, the Spirit speaks to those who, remember this promise? The Spirit speaks to those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. It's what we're doing this morning. We're doing all this year. And blessed are those who hear it. That's what you're doing this morning. And take to heart what is written. That's Revelation 1 verse 3. Now we've talked about the, the four approaches to the book of Revelation. I told you, and you can go back and, and watch the, the, the messages online, why I would take a futurist approach to interpreting the book of Revelation. So, so the futurist approach that this is talking about the 10, uh, the, the future 
chapters one through three would be the historist approach. Okay, then chapters four through 22 is the future. What hasn't happened, what happens after the church age. So if we take, we go to this historist approach, which is under, you know, these first three chapters, each letter written to a church clearly lays out the different ages of the church. You read it and you're like, holy shnikes. I mean, this is laying out the last 2,000 years of history that we've, we've seen. Starting right here with the apostolic church. This church started in Acts chapter 2 at, at Pentecost and will end when John dies because he's the last apostle. Then we get to the persecuted church. Then we get to the Catholic church. And then we get to the Crusades, Martin Luther, and the Reformation, the, the World Missions Church, and then we get to our church today, which has a lot of lights and show. It's in Revelation. You just need the night vision goggles. But here's a cool thing. These are not just night vision goggles. These are like some cool tactical goggles, the book of Revelation, where you can press a button and get various views like infrared, binoculars, Heat seeking, x ray, you know, whatever. So if we go to the, the binocular lens, okay, we'll just call this the 80 95 lens. So the Holy Spirit is speaking to those who speak, who read this aloud and listen to it. And there's different lenses we can look at it, and they're all correct. So as we read this letter, we can take the 80 95 lens, which is that this letter to the Ephesians. It shares an evaluation and warnings for the historic church that existed in Ephesus in 95 AD from Jesus. Yep, it does. We just read about it. We know what was going on in this important church that was so cr critical to the spread of the gospel. Irenaeus, second, second century historian, tells us what happened. They listened. They did. They listened to what John said here. Probably because John returned and he was the pastor of Ephesus and he said, hey, guys, we're going back to that love we used to have, right? So then we click the button again. We get a different view, right? And it's that historist view. We can read this, and we can clearly see this is talking about the apostolic church. They started off with this love for God, love for Jesus, love for people. And that's when, you know, when Paul was there, and it was love, love, love. And then Timothy, and then John. And over time, they've grown more stagnant. They've lost that love and passion for God they used to have. Get it back. So we can clearly read it there. You know, we can, we can see this. The historist lens is that the letter to Ephesus depicted the apostles' church that existed from Acts 2 until the last apostle died, which was John. He died sometime after AD 98. We don't know exactly what day. You can actually go to Ephesus. If you ever go there, they have where John's grave site was. Um, the body isn't there anymore, but there is very good archaeological evidence that that's the actual location John was buried in, there in Ephesus after he left Patmos. So then we click the button again, and we get a different lens. And this lens, I'll call the, the AD 2022 lens, which is that there are churches today that resemble the Ephesians church. To see it, though, you need infrared. Infrared doesn't see the light we can see. It sees light that we can't see. So let's take an infrared view here. Is it there are churches today called the 2022 lens that the letter to Ephesus depicts types of churches that exist today and have in every church age. And then the final lens is more of an x-ray lens. <laughs> and we'll call this the personal lens. It's a letter to Ephesus depicts types of people that exist in every church. There are people in this church who used to have a love for Jesus, but it's, it's grown stale. And the last two are probably the most important. You know, just as a pastor, man, it's, it's that question, does our church reflect the Ephesian church? Lord, help us not. Started off with passion. Band can come up here, by the way. Started off with passion, love for God, love for people. It drove everything we do, but now it's just kind of grown stale. Lord, help us not. 
especially as a pastor, because the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. May this church be motivated by love. Or how about me as a Jesus follower? When I come to church or serve or raise my hand, is it out of a sense of duty or obligation? I'd rather be anywhere but here, or am I here because I'm supposed to be? Lord, give me a love for you and a passion for people because the only works that you accept are acts motivated by God, by love. And I just want, there's one more lens I want to look at. I know we're long, but I don't care. (laughs) There's one more lens we have to look at, which we'll call the archeological lens. And this lens is like a surveyor lens. You know that thing where they survey land? Because if you look at Ephesus at the time John wrote this, it was its heyday. It's when it was New York, New York. And Las Vegas, Las Vegas. (laughs) And it's because of this port. This port that would bring people in. But here's the thing about this port. This is why, where all the money came from. Is that before this time, the sea actually came all the way into Ephesus there to the harbor. But then during this first century, it started silting in. So they actually had, excuse me, to dig a canal to connect the the sea to their port. And they kept trying to keep that thing going. But then what ended up happening is, is sometimes over the next couple hundred years, there was so much silt, so much silt that kept coming in, it just turned it into swampland. If you go to Ephesus today, This is the view. That's their port, completely cut off from the ocean, from the sea. Is that how you feel? It's amazing how each of these churches, there's like an archaeological element to it that, man, it it represents our heart. Man, we have this passion and love for God, but man, it's just become silty. What do we do? Jesus told us, remember Remember who I am. Remember how you used to love me. Repent of growing stagnant. Turn around and say, Lord, I'm so stagnant. I need more of you, less of me. Would you just draw me to you? And he fills you with his spirit and you begin to redo what you used to do. Some of us need to pray that and we're gonna do it together as a church. We're gonna all stand up right now. Go ahead and stand up. We're gonna sing this new song. But it's all, Jesus, I need more of you, less of me. If more of you means less of me, take everything. I want to love you with passion. I want to love you with all my heart. Lord, that this church would love you and do everything that we do because we love you and love people. Let's make this song the prayer of Calvary Mac.